Um, well, thank you very much um, to Gaminder and everyone who's organised such an amazing, rich and packed day. Um, and I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I want, well, I want to say thank you for staying the course, but also feel absolutely full of ideas and provocations and thoughts. Um, so what uh, Cathy and I will do um, now is uh, not tell you what reparative <laughs> histories are <laughs> and not repair the world, unfortunately. Sorry, Amit. Um, but hopefully try and draw some threads together. Um, and uh, what I want to do is circle back to some of the, the, the questions and, and, and debates that came up first thing this morning about the culture wars and where we are in them and, 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 and what they might be asking us to do and think about. Um, and, uh, and then um, Cathy will go on to talk a little bit about the ways in which we've been together thinking about the idea of reparative histories for, for, for a while now. Um, one of the things that struck me today is that while we've been sort of talking about the culture wars and also talking about all sorts of projects and initiatives and kind of demands for repair, restore, um, for rerouting archives, for thinking about what a more demanding um, relationship to history might be, to use Priya Gopal's words, um, to think about what it might mean to rehistoricize. Uh, why we know what we know and what we don't know and, how, and all the ways in which we are perhaps blinded um, to um, questions of legacy and continuity um, when it comes to the colonial past in this country. We haven't really spoken that much about the idea of the reparative itself. Um, so that might be something um, that we can open up for discussion about afterwards. Um, but both, so, so what I wanted to kind of start by saying is that, you know, both the British culture wars and ideas of the reparative are kind of shaped, the meanings of those things are shaped historically and not abstractly. And things are changing really quite fast at the moment. Noticing that the culture wars um, and what they're actually about, that they are about the struggle to redefine what Britishness is and what it is not, and about finding the, defining the terms on which you can belong now and for the future seems to be key. So I'd like to speak to some of the contested and shifting contexts within which our conversations today have been taking place. Um, and then Cathy, as I said, will move on to think about some of the ways that the concept of reparative histories might open up a space for further critical reflection. So Britain and Britishness are in trouble. They are being attacked and undermined. British national identity is under severe threat and it needs saving. Thankfully, it's been saved from the EU, but there are other things threatening it. The international liberal elite, wokery, devolution, globalization, multiculturalism, Islamization, immigration, and ill-informed young people who want to rip up the public landscape and rewrite history. Britain is a buccaneering global Britain. Britain has taken back control. Britain sends out warships to defend its fish from the French and warships to defend its borders from Afghani, Syrian and African refugees heading this way in blow up dinghies. Except when the latter directive proved not to be to the Navy's taste, those refugees suddenly seemed useful as pawns in the latest British scramble for Africa. And even more recently, they're be going to be confined, apparently, off Britain's borders, aboard a modern iteration of convict hulks. Britishness, like all national identities, or indeed, as Gaminda's reminded us today, imperial identities, was and is about fixing things in place. The problem with today's fish, and yesterday's fish and people, is that they don't stay where they're supposed to. History, too, seems prone to errancy. Apparently, it also needs to be fixed in place. Now, that may all sound a little bit flippant, but it's deadly serious, of course. The so-called culture war is framed by what should and shouldn't be common sense, fixity. And on this incredibly fertile ground, the war is aimed at framing anti-racism or historical and intellectual inquiry as dysfunctional attacks on public order or British heritage. This discourse is designed to bolt one to the other, of course. For example, the acquittal of the Colston Four was condemned as a charter for vandals and history deniers. 
The term culture wars is a powerful ideological red herring, a way of covering over, deflecting, or redirecting the latest struggle over the historically forged connections between Britishness, race, and belonging. To talk about culture wars today is a way of not talking about race, when in fact the culture wars are all about the meaning of Britishness and its relation to a colonial, racializing, and racist history. If a common sense principle like history, or public order, or freedom of speech needs defending, then it doesn't look like you're against the anti-racists. Should we know about how many stately homes were built with the profits from trafficking and exploiting captive peoples? And does that mean that the great love of British gardening is racist? <laughs> I'm less concerned here with the excesses of the right-wing press or with a moralistic liberal outrage at such crazy hysteria. I'm drawing attention to the ground here or place to which the debate about race and nation has been purposefully shifted. Calling for roads to be felled or felling Colston registers much more than who gets to decide the fate of an ugly statue. They raise uncomfortable questions about how empire benefited different local communities and the nation as a whole, both then and now. In other words, not only those directly involved in imperialism were enriched by it. This is not based on some inchoate sense that it might have been the case. For example, the Legacies of British Slavery Project has provided open access, irrefutable evidence that it is the case. It's easy to forget, in fact, and we were talking about this earlier a little, just how staggering it is that any systematic study of the records detailing the beneficiaries of the 20 million pounds paid out in 1835 to the men and women who regarded themselves as owners of enslaved peoples in compensation for their loss had not been undertaken before now. Those records have been in the National Archive since 1836. No one ever looked. This money was an imperial severance package, effectively laundering property in human beings and the memory of holding property in human beings into abstract cash and setting in train a stubbornly resilient process of metropolitan divestment and disavowal from slavery. Read in a reparative context, however, that colonial archive produced by a determination to siphon away a discredited time and place in order to cleanse the nation, now offers a way of tracing those monies down the streets and into the houses and living rooms of Britain. The statues as visible markers of British imperialism have been politically activated precisely because they are tangible reminders of the continuity of privilege and persisting forms of inequality that are then expressed and policed through naming the limits of local and national belonging. Naming the current struggle over Britishness as a culture war is an attempt to neutralize the current challenge to the historically sedimented, hopefully fixed, racist meanings of Britishness and about framing this challenge as somehow only a matter of culture and representation and as not about the historically accumulated and materially embedded structures of inequality and exclusion to which they are allied. This is not to say that culture is merely a symptom of an underlying economic and political configuration. Precisely the opposite. Culture is now the ground for politics. Culture is always material. But alongside this culture war, and in ways that are increasingly disruptive of its obfuscatory logics, has been the latest iteration of the campaign for reparations for enslavement. And I know earlier we were talking about wider notions of repair, but I just want to focus on, on this campaign just for a moment. The call for reparations has a long history, it's not new, a transnational history, going back to black abolitionism of the 18th century, shaped by the radical traditions of the Reconstruction era in the States, the 20th century black power movements, and now the movement for black lives and by the CARICOM Commission. The multifaceted revived 21st century campaign has probably never been so publicly visible, hotly debated, and politically disruptive. In the current climate, 
where questions of race and power are being forced through the lens of culture, the movement for reparations, as it has always done, insists on magnifying the material history underpinning the making of race in the context of Britain's slaving and colonial past and are marking out the historical provenance of the current project of disavowing black life and black labor in race-making capitalism. The movement for reparations never settled for the kind of over the last period, the recent self-serving Euro-American liberal cosmopolitan reflexes that were aimed, have been aimed in various places at recognizing the trauma and acknowledging the pain of victims of history through commemoration and monumentalization. The packaging up and solemn consignment of the crimes of the past to the past in the service of apparent consensus or healing or moving on have been viewed as colonizing in their own right. This is not to say that trauma, the demand for recognition and the desire to move on have not been central to the reparative claim, but they're being made on different terms. They're not confined to contemplating injury or apportioning blame. Rather, the claim is animated by a refusal to understand history from the vantage point of contemporary progress and reason, precisely the refusal to monumentalize the past. It's a claim that is part of an ongoing emancipatory struggle in the name of the future, fueled by the desire to move beyond reparations. There's a dramatic intensification of UK institutions, corporations and families engaging in disclosure and restorative actions right now, from universities to the church, the Trevelyan family, as we mentioned, and the Guardian's extraordinary reports this week, just to name a few examples. This is real action amidst which the silence of the state and the monarchy is becoming deafening, especially given the recent announcements by the Dutch government, for example. But as Vereen Shepherd, the vice chair of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, noted the other day, these moves are welcome at long last, on the whole, but it's still they who are deciding when and what and how much. Following the money tells us much about diverse beneficiaries and about the ways in which it's structured and modernizing Britain and molded British identities, but little about the enslaved, as the, the legacies of British slavery project team have acknowledged from the beginning. And it needs to be noted that the Guardian's reparative project that went live this week has actually broken new ground by identifying in their research as far as possible the enslaved peoples connected to the plantations from which the paper's founders extracted their wealth and beginning to trace something of their stories. And so on the Jamaican plantation owned by one of the founder members, um, they've managed to enname the enslaved because of course registers uh, were in place in the early 19th century and they've identified um, one man who was, one man at least who was involved in the Jamaica Baptist Rebellion. So the challenge of connecting histories from above with those from below in this context is not new as of course. And as I said, the latest phase of the legacies of British Slave Ownership Project is also devoted now to illuminating the lives of the enslaved as well. These findings are a necessary reminder of the matrix of alternative cultural, political, and economic structures and practices. In other words, the worlds built by enslaved peoples, what the Haitian writer John Casimir has called the counter plantation system that was always at odds with the slaveholders' interest in labor exploitation and about creating autonomy and independence. Here, making the grounds of metropolitan accumulation visible is not so much of the issue as understanding the relationship between the everyday lives and resistances <coughs> practiced on the plantations and that metropolitan accumulation. Or what Ángel Quintero Rivera calls the shifting contradiction between plantation and counterplantation, between slavery and escape. Making the dialectical connection rather than simply noting the conjunction or the coincidence between accumulation and resistance 
will hopefully further complicate the spatial and the temporal boundaries upon which contemporary abolitionist memory still depends. For example, by resituating the story about Britain's ending of slavery within the context of global capitalist development. This history of struggle can galvanize new public histories of connection rather than disconnection, as I think that Guardian's re-spotlighting of the role of cotton in Britain's industrial revolution post-1838 highlights. Krista Pertley, the historian, has noted that despite considerable challenges, Britain's true relationship with and debt to enslavement will perhaps be clearer when the lived realities of colonial towns, small holdings and plantations can be held in the same analytic frame as Britain's country houses, townhouses and parliamentary debates. Bringing the lived realities of those enslaved on plantations into the same analytical frame as Britain's local geographies will counter some of the conventional and usually racialized divisions between histories of resistance, slave resistance, and anti-slavery activism. And this would underline the ways in which the history of the nation makes no sense if rendered without a transnational and connected framework that emphasizes the interconnectedness always of here and there and then and now. Thank you. So in relation to that now that Anita's just finished on, in his recent book, uh, Reconsidering Reparations, Ofemi Otairu reminds us that, quote, forces opposed to justice stand ready to reverse the gains of yesterday's struggles entirely should the opportunity present itself. Now, this attempt at reversal, as we've been hearing about today, is at the centre of the culture wars and the global rise of an emboldened right. It is those yesterday struggles that Otairu speaks about, which is at the heart of our concept of reparative history. Not yesterday struggles as a place to retreat from our present nastiness, but as a vital resource in challenging the rancid politics of contemporary racial capitalism. Our approach to history, in part, echoes David Rodiger's insistence that radical historiography should be concerned not so much with a usable past, but a usable present, which he argues would enable us to, quote, pose different and better questions about the past. Anita and I have organized two conferences, edited a special edition of Race and Class, published two articles and a book chapter about reparative histories, and we're still not quite sure what the term means. So we're not here to offer you a particular schematic or discrete definition of what the term might or should mean. Instead, what we are interested in is the way in which the concept of the reparative is necessarily shaped by the political, the cultural, the historical, and the social contexts in which it's constituted and which it's mobilized. Crucially for our work, Reparative histories, precisely as Anita alluded to, seeks to trouble the spatial and temporal boundaries, which create clean lines of demarcation between the past and the present and between the there and the here. There's nothing prescriptive about this mobilisation of this term that we use, and we are really interested in how you might think about those boundaries, or indeed about this term itself. The question of reparations, as Anita has just said, is central to how we think about our present conjuncture. But what we're particularly interested in is how calls for reparations open up historical narratives of race and class, narratives that are precisely marginalised and silent in dominant liberal definitions of the nation, um, and sometimes even in terms of definitions of what history is. So, for example, one of the most widespread responses to the Rose Must Fall campaign in the UK was this mobilisation of the ubiquitous snowflake student who insisted that their present-day sensibilities should dictate historical narratives. It was argued that these hypersensitive whingers were calling the past to account in ways which simply cannot work because the high imperial moment was of a different era. So the idea that you can't ask Cecil Rhodes to pass a millennial diversity test. 
Now, this didn't just come from the right-wing media, though they have a purient interest in campus politics these days. It also informed more liberal thinking. The highly respected Cambridge scholar, Mary Beard, was worried that these students were attempting to, quote, erase the past. This conflation of history and the past seems a worrying oversight for a classics professor. As history students learn in their first class of their first year, history is not the past. History is a narrative about that past. And moreover, if the past is indeed embodied by a rabid white supremacist colonialist, then surely that should precisely prompt questions about the relationship of the past to contemporary Britain. As Nesbine Malik argued in yesterday's Guardian, the campaign to protect our history is now about protecting the past from historians and protecting the present from dangerous new ideas about how we got here. This idea of fossilizing the past is even more stark when we think about the erasure of empire that has until very recently been central to Britain's dominant narrative of itself as a nation, a nation that's informed by tolerance and moderation, where very importantly, empire has to belong, not to here and now, but to over there and then. And more recently, we've seen the re-emergence of the insistence that what happened over there was much more complex than colonial plunder, racialized killing, and widespread cultural and ecological destruction of swathes of the globe. Uh, usually, it's railways uh, which are cited uh, in, in relation to this balance. I mean, if railways are a way to, to be an indicator of civilization, this country needs to be colonized really quickly. Um, but, but, I mean, this is something that Alan spoke about uh, a little bit earlier, but also the really good work he's been doing on Nigel Bigger's text um, is precisely to take on that kind of ridiculous uh, political notion. In our contemporary moment, therefore, frantic, frantic claims of heritage and legacy are rallying forms of white supremacy and colonial apologetics that precisely seek to deny the interval between what Avery Gordon has called the no longer and the not yet. This is a process which seeks to deny contemporary institutionalized racism as much as racialized pasts. As Anita has noted, reparative history is about recognizing historical crimes, but it's also about agency and it can be wedded to a form of memory that is energized by emancipatory activism, solidarity, and political struggles of the past and the present. So any form of politics begins with the articulation of a particular grievance, but it doesn't need to become admired there. Reparative history making is concerned with grievance as a starting point of politics, um, a starting point with no easy relation to any kind of restorative project but also with recognizing that grievance, that rage, as an agent of history. The history of black and brown resistance to racialization and colonization makes very specific, active claims on the past and on the present. Much of the black radical tradition exposed and rejected liberal paradigms which placed them as passive objects of paternalistic discourses in which their oppression was unfortunate but unconnected to the working modes of racial capitalism. Now, the black radical tradition, the term I've just used there, is a contested term, but for our purposes today, we're referring to Cedric Robinson's definition of the black radical tradition as, quote, an accretion over generations of collective intelligence gathered from struggle, where the purpose of the struggles informed by the tradition <clears throat> became the overthrow of the whole race-based structure. We suggest that the idea of the reparative might be conceptualized in terms of a need to concurrently trace how the legacies of colonialism and enslavement have been racialized in a manner which precisely refuses this black radical claim on and indeed transformation of concepts like freedom and liberty. In W.E.B. Du Bois's famous formulation in terms of so-called emancipation in the US, he says, quote, the slave went free, stood a moment in the sun, then moved back towards slavery. 
Arguing for a recentering of the place of black resistance in how we might understand notions of liberation that have proliferated in the global north, Priego Pal has argued that the archive reveals that, quote, freedom was a contested concept whose content was often determined through experience and struggle. Moreover, she argues that, quote, the process of contestation was not without its impact on metropolitan ideologies and practices. So in addition to forefronting the agency of the colonized, Priya also reveals how concepts of liberty and freedom were understood by anti-colonial activists outside of dominant Eurocentric understandings of these terms. The direction of travel of liberatory ideas between the metropole and the colony was not unidirectional. Indeed, my own research on African-American communism points precisely to a transformation of concepts of race and class which challenged and reimagined these terms as they had been understood by the traditional left. Again, Anisha has talked about the transnational history of the campaign for reparations. And indeed, the black tra radical tradition as a whole has also been one that is diasporic and transnationalism transnational, I should say. From the call of the Haiti to the enslaved on plantations across the Caribbean and the Americas, to global journeys of black abolitionists, to the global imaginary of the Black Panthers, to the current manifestations of solidarity between African Americans and Palestinians, the black radical tradition has always made a host of connections that inform a global understanding or global understandings of race and power. As Brent Hayes Edwards notes, quote, black radicalism necessarily emerges through boundary crossing. Black radicalism is an internationalization. That transnational framework for understanding the vectors of resistance that have shaped contemporary anti-racist struggles is also central to understanding racial capitalism outside of the claims of the nation states of empire. To trace resistances that problematize the bonds of the local is to trace a politics which disrupts, deep, which disrupts uh, discrete boundaries of identity and belonging. Um, and I think this is true even of very local spaces. So it was really interesting in Ben and Bal's paper earlier on today to talk about the way in which the local is reimagined by those who have a different purchase on it outside of the kind of dominant ideas of white Britishness. So to underline again, our work centers on the idea of reparative histories, which is not strictly about reparations in terms of compensation. What we're interested in is the space opened up by the call for reparations, to think about how history and memory are mobilized in ways that neutralize the past and negate the connections between that racialized past and, the, and racialized present structures structures which continue to vilify and exploit racialized subjects. And how this mobilization of the past is one which also erases the powerful resistances to racialization and colonization. Reparative histories, if the concept is useful at all, is intended to regalvanize a politics which pushes against the ways in which resistance has been downplayed, overlooked, cauterized or moderated within liberal narratives of imperialism, both historical and contemporary. Part of our project of reparative histories is to draw attention to the way in which the racialized discourses of liberal democracy have not only marginalized black and brown labor and black and brown resistance, but actually this liberal narrative is dependent upon those erasures. Reparations only looks like special pleading if one reads the history of enslavement and colonization as aberrations, as opposed to as constitutive of Western democracy and Western modernity. Liberal accounts of empire, even when they might be under attack from openly racist accounts of empire, are also under attack from a revivified black liberation struggle um, that began um, earlier um, in, the, in, this, sorry, in the last decade. And I think that they're being challenged in particular in relation to the idea of what we might mean by repair. The question of who decides what that term means, on whose terms can it be delivered, 
Under what conditions can it be imagined? And from what threads is that imagination woven? And these are deeply political as well as historical questions. If, as kind of uh, suggested by the structure of this day, <laughs> reparative histories might offer a way out of the reactionary whiteness instantiated by the, by the culture wars, it is in part driven by those political imaginaries which have been central to stretching our understandings of liberatory politics beyond the boundaries of race and place and linear notions of history. The practice of excavating these multifaceted politics of resistance is neither disinterested nor purely polemical. It's about worrying those blithe boundaries of time and space, thoroughly racialized boundaries, which work to keep forms of white supremacy intact and forms of black resistance particularized and domesticated. It's about demystifying the puny concepts of liberalism, or li liberation, I should say, offered by contemporary liberal democracy, and versions of history which see the present as some kind of natural terminus to the past. The present is not a corrective to the racialized crimes of the past, and the reparations calls that are emerging across the globe precisely open up a really important space for troubling those kind of banal assessments of our current conjuncture. So that's how we've been thinking about reparative histories, but we're far more interested <laughs> to see what you might think um, about reparative histories. All right, um, that was excellent, thank you very much.